Why uh, building regulation so important for climate adaptation? Well, buildings are around for a long time. And as you can see uh, from the photo, uh, that's actually the view outside my front door, just on the other side of Albert Park Lake. And there's a 100-year-old house on the corner. Uh, next to it, a block of flats that are about 30 years old. And down the end of the street, uh, an apartment that's about 10 years old. And all of those buildings were built under different building regulations. But the buildings that we're building today, of course, are going to be around for up to 100 years. And so we need to take climate change into account when we regulate those new buildings. Now, looking at my street, I'm not likely to face uh, cyclones, or at least I hope I'm not, and nor likely to face uh, bushfires. But uh, that's the view outside my front door uh, in November last year, and I have to say I always did want a waterfront view, and that's sort of the closest I've got. But I'm uh, like the many, many Australians who live close to the coast. And in fact, more than 7% of Australian addresses are located within three kilometres of the coast and have an elevation of six metres or less above sea level. And homes uh, like that are very much at risk of the combination of sea level rise and surge, storm surge, in a time of climate change. So we are going to have to make sure that our building regulations and our planning regulations are able to cope with that. And I think you'd all be aware of the significant impacts that climate change can have on buildings. Heatwave, of course, uh, has an impact on the building itself, but more importantly, on the occupants with major health impacts. And We've seen uh, already the impact of major uh, cyclones and storms, sea level rise and bushfire, and the climate science would seem to indicate that in the future, the risk is that we'll face more intense storms and cyclones, more frequent bushfires and rising sea levels. So how can building regulations help with all of this? And first, of course, uh, building regulations can ensure that the thermal performance of the building is better. That is, it is better and more efficient. And that, of course, in a, in a warming climate, means better performance and a safer place for the occupants. But there are other things that building regulations can do also. They can ensure that we improve the fixings in the buildings from the roof to the foundations and we better brace and re uh, the resistance in the buildings to counter more intense cyclones and more uh, and stronger winds. Of course thinking back to the rising sea levels it's important that vulnerable services in the buildings, indeed the floor levels itself, are above flood levels. And for uh, those in this part of Australia who experienced not just the terrible bushfires in 2009, but in fact th three major series of bushfires in the last decade, we know that uh, many buildings are in bushfire prone areas and more needs to be done to design those buildings as far as possible to be bushfire resistant. With increasing rainfall intensity, will be important to increase the capacity of guttering to cope with that increased rainfall. So there are many specific building regulations that are going to assist in adapting to a changing climate. And in many ways, building regulation is where the rubber hits the road in regulation for adaptation. So how does it uh, all fit together? Well, we have a national construction code, and that is a code developed by the Australian Building Codes Board that is then incorporated in various state legislation, state uh, building and plumbing laws. And in a sense, this is a good news story for Australia because we are one place that has uh, 
agreed nationally to have consistent building regulation. And that's a great step forward, and I might compare that to planning, where, there's, as you know, there's very different rules all around the country and, indeed, between uh, different local government areas. And how that national construction code uh, works is going to be very important. First, we need to ensure that we work closely with planning. So, for example, going to look at the, uh, the sea level rise and flooding example, planning can define the use of certain land, that is, to prohibit certain land that might be flood prone under a climate scenario from being developed. But if buildings are there, we've got to ensure that they're safe. And the National uh, Construction Code focus is on new buildings, and that only represents about 2% of the total stock. So you might say, well, is that very important? We should be really concentrating on existing buildings. But if you think that in 2060, uh, about 50% of the buildings that are there are yet to be built today. In other words, if we look at a climate change scenario going forward to 2060, about half the buildings will be built between now and then. So we better get it right in our regulation. The National Construction Code has always addressed uh, extreme events like earthquakes and cyclones, but I think there is a real question now whether that code is appropriate given climate change. And for that reason, the Australian Building Codes Board prepared a report in 2010 on climate adaptation. And what the report found is that in a low emissions scenario up to 2050, most buildings that are constructed under the current building code are likely to cope, and that's largely because we've upped the standards in the code in recent years. But the greatest risk is, in fact, to existing buildings, those buildings you saw on the first slide that were constructed prior to today's building standards. The report did find, though, that if climate change associated with a higher emission scenario eventuates, then current buildings may also be at risk in the second part of this century. And recommended that more work be done on cyclones, bushfires, flooding and thermal performance. The report also highlighted the need to ensure that land use planning and the building code work closely together and highlighted the challenge that we face in developing and implementing new regulations if we are to comply with the COAG principles of best practice regulation. And essentially that is because under those rules, we have to be able to show a net benefit of any regulation. And that can be pretty difficult when there is uncertainty about the impacts of climate change and therefore uncertainty in the quantification of that net benefit. And those principles will uh, guide our uh, future regulations, those COAG principles, and they are that we have to consider a range of options, policy options on costs and benefits, and we have to adopt the option with the greatest net benefit. And I emphasise the process we go through. We have a regulatory impact statement which identifies the costs of the regulation, it identifies the benefits, and in order for the regulation to proceed, it has to show that the net present value of the benefits outweighs the net present value of the costs. And we have to do that with a discount rate of 7%. And so that uh, can be quite a challenge and a hurdle. Now, to address the specifics of business and business attitudes to changes to the National Construction Code. For business, regulation can mean increased costs of building. And of course, for a business uh, that's about uh, making a profit and being able to continue to be sustainable, that is a significant issue. But as well as the increased costs of the building itself, there can be significant compliance costs associated with new regulation. And also, it can involve new designs and business processes, and that shouldn't be underestimated. You look at the way most homes are built in this country, relatively small uh, home builders, 
they have their own systems. If we change the regulation, they have to change the system, and that's pretty tough for small uh, builders to do. Of course, a change uh, in the building regulations can advantage a business competitors, and we've seen that where some smart businesses, for example, have taken a lead in energy efficiency in housing, and when new regulation supporting energy efficiency has been introduced, that's been an advantage for those early movers. And business are free to have higher requirements like that uh, if they choose. So there are challenges for business in uh, changed and, and improved regulation. And so that's one of the reasons we ensure uh, at the Australian Building Codes Board that business is actively involved in the process of new regulation. We have a committee structure where the board itself has significant business representation. So the board is made up of representatives of each of the states and territories, the Commonwealth, and there are five industry representatives and myself as the independent chair. We also have a building codes committee that advises on all proposed changes to the construction code. And then when there is a proposal for change, there's very extensive consultation that involves business in uh, advising on the proposed change to regulation. And looking through the process, there'll be a proposal for a change. Uh, the inputs into that are both the science, including the climate science and business. That proposal will be developed up into a regulation. Once again, there's input from the science and business. And then there's consultation, usually around a regulatory impact statement. Now, what's the view of business? Well, it wouldn't surprise you that business has different views depending upon where they come from. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, many construction companies and builders can be quite opposed to change, whereas designers and architects uh, are quite uh, in favour. And so I think it would be untrue to say that there's a, a common view of business. However, I think business has shown, and when I'm talking about business, we're talking about the construction business, the property business, developers, uh, contractors, designers and architects, really all of the players in building. When we talk about that group of business, they have been very engaged in the process, and I think that's positive. The key business input into the discussion is not around the climate science. That's usually accepted. Uh, we don't have a lot of experience of businesses debating the climate science. What we do have is businesses debating the amount of costs and perceived benefits as a result of the regulatory change. And business can be very influential in doing that. And to give one example, the uh, Australian Building Codes Board recently went through a process of considering cyclones and the impact of cyclones in certain parts of Australia. And there was a proposal to extend the cyclone affected areas in different parts of the country, including south in Queensland down to cover the area of the Sunshine Coast. An initial regulatory impact statement was released which showed that that had a significant net benefit to extend the region, and that would have involved increased costs and increased protection for buildings that might be subject to cyclones in that Sunshine Coast area. The business input into that process was essentially to say that the regulatory impact statement had got it wrong about the amount of benefits claimed, and to a lesser degree about the costs. As a result of that, a new regulatory impact statement was released which showed, in fact, a net loss rather than a net benefit, and that proposal did not proceed. And so, essentially, that is the, the way business has had a very important impact on the final regulations that we have. Just to, to conclude, I think, with some of the key climate hazards that the Australian Building Codes Board is currently considering. First, flooding, and we have out now for consultation a proposed standard for flooding, 
This will increase the regulatory requirements for buildings in areas that are potentially flood prone as identified by local governments. Uh, and that's out for consideration now. We are still doing quite a bit of work on bushfire and uh, there's been a revised standard, Australian standard, but we're also doing work on uh, bushfire uh, shelters in bushfire prone areas. I've indicated we're still uh, considering work on cyclones and on heat stress. And in all of those areas, uh, there's an opportunity not only for business input, but for public input as well. Finally, I guess with a research audience, it's worth emphasising that we do have considerable research needs if we are going to have the most efficient regulation and appropriate. We do need to review uh, some of the work on uh, the ability of buildings to cope with bushfire and measures to reduce heat stress. We would certainly benefit from an investigation of the impact of climate design change on design annual probabilities of exceedance for climate hazards because many of the building regulations are actually designed in this way to enable buildings to meet certain design annual probabilities. For example, wind, one in thousand year floods or winds more than a certain uh, force. And what we need to know is what is the impact of climate change on that. A probability distribution function for extreme events, cyclones and bushfires would certainly assist in the regulatory impact statement process. And finally, we need more consideration of how best to protect and regulate existing buildings, which are not normally part of the uh, building regulation framework, and best practice regulation for uncertain but potentially catastrophic risks. Thank you. Thank you.